When you lift weights, you're not just training your muscles, you're also training your bones, you're training your brain, and you're training your flexibility, and you're training your energy and your heart, and you're training your tendons and your connective tissue. So tendons will always be trained when you lift weights, but as with all of those other things, it's also a good idea to do specific training for your tendons if you want to get the very most out of your body. Not only will training your tendons prevent injury, but it'll make you more explosive, it'll increase your maximum strength, your ability to make use of all that muscle power that you've built. So in other words, if you intend on getting stronger, you need tend on strength. Oh dear. So tendon strength can often be a limiting factor in physical performance. So a while ago on this channel, for instance, I talked about a gene doping technique that could block myostatin, myostatin being a molecule that prevents uh, the building of muscle, it encourages it to be broken down, and it prevents it from getting too big. When you block this, muscle gets bigger naturally. However, what I didn't go into in depth there was that the knockout mice that had the myostatin removed were more likely to experience tendon injuries. And part of that might be because tendons actually require myostatin. Myostatin plays a, a maintenance role in tendons and ligaments. However, it could also be that the muscles have outpaced the tendon strength, thus leading to injury. And this is also what we see in a lot of people who use anabolic steroids. They grow their muscles too quickly, and as a result, they're far more likely to experience tendon injury. So if you build muscle, then you need to make sure you're building your tendons at the same rate. And what anabolic steroids or myostatin do is they exacerbate a problem that already exists, and that's that we don't have as much blood flow to the tendons and to the ligaments as we do for the muscles. And that means that the tendons, they take a lot longer to grow stronger, to develop more uh, power as compared with the muscles. So if you go to the gym and start lifting weights regularly, then you'll see structural changes in your muscle within eight days. So you should start to see progress pretty quickly. But in the tendons, you don't start to see any structural change for at least two months. So that explains why a lot of people are super eager head to the gym, start lifting really heavily, they get tendon injuries because their muscles mean that they can start lifting heavier weights but their tendons aren't ready yet and they injure themselves. So in order to prevent this, we need to make sure that we ease ourselves into exercise. See, kids don't have so much of a problem with tendon injuries and that's because they're constantly running, they're constantly jumping, climbing, playing games. However, adults, we tend to spend a lot of time sitting at a computer, not doing very much, sitting on a couch. So our tendons aren't getting that regular uh, exercise, that regular stimulation, and then suddenly we hit the gym and we start lifting big heavy weights. It's no wonder that you're gonna experience some kind of problem. So what we need to do before we start lifting heavy weights is to ramp up our physical exercise with lots of uh, high volume, lots of light weight, just to get the body moving again and to build up the tendon strength to support the heavy weights that we're gonna be moving around later on. So frequency and volume is one of the most important things when you're starting out in order to strengthen your tendons. And doing a lot of pump work is good as well because as I said, part of the problem here is blood flow heading to that connective tissue. The good news is that tendons also are much slower to lose that strength after you finish training. So that means that you can switch from a higher volume, lighter weight kind of program to a more intensity based program later on once you've built that stable base of tendon strength and also do pump work. That means very high repetition, light weights, just like the stuff I talked about for uh, vascularity training. All of those techniques, you know, long supersets, uh, 20 repetitions, etc., with light weights right at the beginning will increase blood flow to the tendons and therefore help them to recover more and to respond to the stimulus you're giving them by training them. If you wanna see an example of just what increasing frequency and volume can do for your finger strength, then look no further than the rock climber. A rock climber with 15 plus years of experience who regularly uses their hands to hold their entire weight is going to see an increase in tendon thickness in the hands and in the wrists and the forearms of 62 to 76 percent. So that's huge. Their tendons are hugely thicker. And if you want to see a really visceral example of this, then look no further than Alex Honnold, professional rock climber who just has these beefy, huge fingers. I found out that reference from Mark Staley Apple, a great website with lots of useful tips on building tendon strength, so I'll link to that in the description down below. Another excellent tool for preventing injury in the tendons is slow eccentrics. That simply means holding a weight and then lengthening the muscle as you gradually lower it. And studies show that, for instance, people suffering from Achilles tendonitis can 
restore normal functionality, reduce pain by using things like slow eccentrics on heel dips. So along with your pump work and your increased volume, you also wanna be doing these slow eccentrics, starting with a light weight. And if you do all this, then over two months, you should build up an excellent base of strength so that we can start loading on the weights. Now that you're confident that your tendons and your ligaments are ready for that increased weight, how are we going to maximize the strength and power of our tendons so that we can lift more and so that we have more long-term strength even as we get older and our muscles start to weaken? So one thing you can do is find ways to lift heavier than your muscles can lift. So your tendons in theory can take more weight than your muscles. So if you can put yourself under that load, even without having to lift yourself to get there, then you can stress the tendons enough to cause massive growth. And this is something that we see in the studies that you do need to apply stress to the tendons in order to see the most growth. Remember, this is only once we've built up enough resilience in our tendons through a frequent and lightweight training program that we've done for a while. So this is more of an advanced technique. So things you can do to lift more than you can lift include using hangs, obviously, using uh, slow negative, so you cheat your way up or you get an assist to get your way up and then you just lower a weight that you can't lift. Overcoming isometrics, which I always talk about, or something like partials. The YouTuber um, Alpha Destiny talks about partials all the time. Um, he loves them, he does lots of uh, rack pulls over the knee and if you check out his channel, well then his results speak for themselves. So the idea is what you're doing is, instead of doing the full range of motion, you're starting the weight much higher up or lower down, or you're finishing before you do the full range of motion. And a lot of people will say, well, full range of motion is really good. And yes, it is. In fact, we've just seen that um, stretching the muscle with something like a heel dip can be very good for building tendons, but so too, if you want that strength, can just loading them up with lots of weight. And if you can't do a deadlift with, you know, whatever this insane weight is, then you might be able to do a rack pull because you're pulling it a much shorter distance. And what this is doing is it's still putting those tendons under that huge load, still thickening and strengthening them. At the same time, this is also a great way of busting plateaus because it teaches you to be more confident with a really heavy weight. And that makes a huge difference. So I've been doing it with bench press, for instance. I just put the, uh, the pins in the rack, high up, lift the uh, barbell off, lower it, and then they hit the rack, and then I just push it back up. That way I can put myself under a heavier weight than I could normally manage on my own, heavier than my one rep max or my one rep max so that I don't risk trapping myself. And then I can just put it back and I've experienced that really heavy weight and my tendons have experienced that really heavy weight and it builds strength. And like I say, if you check out his channel, you'll see that he's developed a huge amount of strength this way. Another similar technique you can use is something called accommodating resistance. And what this means is that you're using a form of resistance that's gonna get heavier as you get to the easier portion of the range of motion. So for instance, you'd be doing a bench press where it's lighter when it's close to your chest and it's heavier when it's further from your chest. So how might you achieve this? Well, one option is to use reverse bands. So bands are attached to the top of the rack and then when they're lowered down, there's less slack. So the bar feels lighter and as you lift them higher up, that um, they then become slack and you're lifting the entire weight. Another option is to use chains. So if you hang chains off the edges of the barbell, then when you lower the barbell, the chains pile up on the floor. And when you raise it again, you're lifting more and more of the chain on top of the barbell. And once again, you can't count this as your one rep max because it is cheating, but it's a fantastic way to put your tendons and your connective tissue and your bones under that huge load. And at the same time to build that confidence, to build the supporting muscles, the balance, and you'll find that it will improve your one rep max when you do the full range of motion. And there's nothing to stop you from doing it at all different ranges of motion to hit the weak parts that you're struggling with, etc. I didn't have chains, so what I did was I used a weighted belt for this example, I was doing dips. And then when I went low enough, the weight rested on the floor. When I got high enough, they picked up along with me. There's also a chance that by doing this, you're overriding or inhibiting the Golgi tendon organ. So this is a, a somewhat pseudoscientific concept. It's a little bit controversial. And the Golgi tendon organ is a lot more complicated and invo involved in a lot of fine muscle movement than a lot of people give it credit for. However, we do know that the Golgi tendon organ may play a role in shutting off strength when it thinks you're lifting too heavy, when it thinks that the contraction is too great and you're going to risk injury. So by training yourself to use heavier weights, the idea is that you're training the Golgan, Golgi tendon organ to shut up so that you can lift heavier without it saying, 
oh dear, and shutting off your all of your strength. A lot of people will say that, you know, when you're lifting a weight, so you're doing bench press and then suddenly you lose all your strength. It's not like you gradually get smaller, get weaker. You suddenly drop it and your spotter has to step in. They say that's the Golgi tendon organ. I say, whether or not that's true remains to be seen, but whatever the mechanism, using these partials does seem to be a good way of overriding your psychological barriers, building up more strength in the connective tissue and the supporting muscles, etc. So I highly recommend giving it a go, actually. There's just a lot of value to occasionally putting yourself under or over a really big amount of weight. You can feel the body responding to that. It's great for grip too. But yes, weighted stretching also is very effective and that makes sense too because really weighted stretching is the natural progression, the natural evolution of um, weighted eccentric, slow eccentric. So that just basically means you're using an increased range of motion where you start to feel a stretch whilst under some kind of resistance. I've done a whole video on that, so check that out. And studies again show that this can build more strength in the tendons. For instance, doing a decline squat has been shown to be more effective at building strength and rehabilitating tendons than the regular squat. So this is something to bear in mind. And that's the other thing to consider with these rock climbers. They're not just rock climbing regularly, they're also under a whole lot of weight. And we see that they're either in a crimp position or a full crimp, so they're stretching their tendons and they're also um, holding a lot of weight in a kind of crimped position with no range of motion. So we're just mimicking that for the rest of the body. So now we know that the tendons play a very important role in building maximal strength. And we know how to train for that specifically by using uh, weighted stretching and by using just huge amounts of weight through overcoming isometrics or hangs or um, partials. However, our tendons also play a big role in explosive movements and that's because they have a kind of, all of our connective tissue has a kind of rebound, it's very elastic, and this is called hysteresis. And the lower your hysteresis, the more efficient you'll be, the less energy it will require for you to run, jump, etc., because more of that energy is being returned via a kind of rebound effect. So actually, tendons play a big, much bigger role in the biomechanics of many movements than you might at first think. So for instance, when we're running, when we're sprinting, if you look at the activation of the muscles, you probably notice there's less activation in the calves than you might think. And that's because the Achilles tendon is actually doing a lot of work simply by rebounding, by storing and returning the energy so that the calf muscle, you're not actually generating so much energy, you're just bouncing off the tarmac. And if you look at animals like cheetahs, like leopards that run super fast, what you'll notice is that they don't have huge calves, they have huge tendons. And in fact, the military are looking into building, you know, stilts, things like the power risers that kind of mimic this tendon in order to give us greater speed. So building more strength, lowering the hysteresis in the Achilles tendon would help to improve your running speed, perhaps more so than building more calf strength. And when you think about it this way, it might actually make more sense not to refer to muscles individually or individual muscle groups, but rather MTUs, which are muscle tendon units. They work as a whole. So tendon can be stiff, meaning that it's thicker and it rebounds, it stores more energy. But a tendon can also be more flexible, or you call that compliant, more compliant, meaning that it's easier to stretch. Some tendons you want to be stiffer, some tendons you want to be more compliant, depending on your biomechanics. And once again, we start to see an interference principle come into play here, because depending on the types of actions you use, whether you're a tennis player, whether you're a swimmer, whether you're a martial artist, you're gonna see different uh, balances of stiffness and compliance in different tendons, different connective tissue throughout your body. And of course, it's not just your tendons that play a role in this, but other types of connective tissue too. So your tendons connect muscle to bone, of course, your ligaments connect bone to bone, they're responsible for your joints, and then you have your muscle fascia, which is kind of like a shrink wrap that surrounds all your muscle and surrounds your internal organs. And muscle fascia also might play a role in this kind of rebound effect by helping you to return that energy from a depth jump, for instance. And of course, the way we train this once again is simply said. Specific adaptations to impose demands, said it a million times. If you want to train for something, you do that thing. So in this case, you do the movement that you want to become more explosive in an explosive manner. I love explosive training. I've talked about it a lot. I've also talked about how eccentric training can improve your explosiveness. Likewise, so too can heavy weights. So if you throw in explosive training too, things like clapping press-ups, depth jumps, um, you know, box jumps, uh, burpees, that kind of thing, then you're going to see more explosiveness and you're going to build that kind of rebound, that stiffness in the tendons. But at the same time, in other areas, if you want to prevent injury or if you just want to improve your flexibility, then train stretching and think about how they're working 
to support one another, but also against one another. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is diet and recovery. We've seen that there's less blood flow to the tendons and the ligaments, so of course they need longer to recover. And if they're injured in any way, then they need even more time to recover. Typically, you should try and leave 48 hours between workouts targeting specific areas that are very heavy or very explosive, and this will give your tendons and your ligaments and your muscle fascia time to recover. At the same time, you wanna try and enhance blood flow to those areas if you can, especially if they're injured. So if you use a cold compress, you'll reduce swelling, but if you use heat, then you can encourage blood flow. So one thing you can do is to use contrast therapy, that means like a shower where you use very hot and very cold in you know, one at a time in order to not only reduce swelling, but also improve blood flow. Massage and self myofascial release might also encourage blood flow to those areas. You want to increase the amount of collagen in your body, so consume vitamin C, this has been shown to increase that, along with calcium, and I'll go into this in more detail in future. I am doing a video soon on healing, and also I recommend that you check out my video on recovery. Watch those and combine it with this kind of training, and you should start to see your tendons become stronger, thicker, more resilient to injury, more explosive, and that will benefit you in every aspect of your performance. So thanks a ton for watching guys. I hope you found this video useful and interesting. It was actually one of the most requested videos on this channel, along with how to increase your healing, which I am getting to. So kind of makes you wonder if you guys are all injured, you know, be careful out there. Um, if you found this video useful and interesting, then please leave a like, please share it around, comment down below, let me know if I missed anything, any tips that you have, uh, any suggestions for future videos. Head over to the Facebook page where you can enjoy um, joining in with the conversation and giving me more suggestions. Follow me on Instagram if you want to see my training or Twitter if you want to hear my random musings. Head over to the blog, there's the fuller version of this uh, in a blog post format, so check that out as, long as, as well as the other articles. And subscribe, hit the bell button for notifications. Stay tuned in general because I've got lots more like this on the way. I'll be talking, like I say, about healing. I'm talking about uh, MI6 training, how to be more like Bond or Jason Bourne. Talking about more Infinity War inspired training, about real life super soldiers. All this stuff, if that sounds good, then uh, stay tuned. I'll see you next time. Thanks a ton for watching. And bye for now.